You're listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, where you get valuable information you just can't find anywhere else. To thrive in today's trying times, you need the Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and get your free newsletter and gift. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Welcome. You are listening to and watching the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, and today is 3321. Well, if you've watched this show for a while, you're familiar with our next guest. Uh, he's made a career out of following the money, and the website is followthemoney.com. Jerry Robinson is with us to talk about the Federal Reserve, Bitcoin, precious metals, and and what's going to happen next. And for questions, comments, just send a, an email to kl at kerrylutz.com and we'll forward it off to Jerry. So Jerry, it's great to have you back on. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Hey, it's always a pleasure. So state of the world economy, where are we now? <laughs> wow. What a first question that is. Where are we? Well, we are somewhere between, um, you know, going off of the cliff and hitting the bottom. Somewhere between there, I, I would say, is probably where we are. Probably, uh, it, you know, actually, it's funny because the economy, of course, is not the stock market. And oh, we got several calls from financial advisors and investment advisors at the beginning of the year, as we normally do, many of them who subscribe to our service or who listen to our show and who we have relationships with. And they wanted to know what we saw, you know, what we saw for the stock market, you know, heading into the new 2021, especially with the new Biden administration and all of this. And based upon everything that we could see at the beginning of the year, at the actually right before the election, I should say, um, was that the, the Federal Reserve has continued its policy that we have seen it do every time we've been into a situation like this before, the Greenspan put or uh, basically the Greenspan doctrine, where if there's a problem, print money, you know, uh, if there's a problem, cut rates. And so we now have interest rates, of course, kind of rising the 10 year and the 30 year have really spiked in 2021, putting pressure on highly valued stocks, because of course, that 10 year treasury yield is used as a function uh, within many stock valuations. And so when that thing was rising, we saw kind of a, a general decline in tech stocks in the price of tech stocks. But overall, Kerry, the stock market, you know, the S&P hit a brand new all time high, just uh, you know, heading into the weekend, uh, last weekend. And so the S&P is at an all time high, and we shouldn't really expect anything but because we do have this incredible amount of liquidity that's been put into the market. And as you and I both know, uh, we've been through this dog and pony show before. We've seen what happens when the Fed pumps in lots of money is that asset prices go up. And so whenever I was, whenever I was asked by these financial advisors at the beginning of the year what I thought was going to happen, of course, I have no crystal ball. It's broken. I don't put any kind of stock even into forecasts too much because it's kind of silly. I can't even, I don't even know what the weather is going to do tomorrow, Kerry. I know, I know what they say that's going to happen, but I don't know for sure. So, uh, but from a realistic perspective, I said, well, with all things being equal, ceteris paribus, we should expect to see more, you know, more higher prices in the stock market. We should expect to see continued pushes higher in asset prices. And so the economy is rebounding because it cratered. You know, I think people are talking about, wow, we're going to have this big growth in 2021. Well, yeah, of course you are, because you just went off the cliff, you know. So, of course, the re and of course, it's also propped up, Kerry, by a tremendous amount of liquidity. You want to know how bad the economy is. Well, well, let's just figure it out. Let's go back and take the 30 year average federal funds rate, which comes in at around 5.6%. Imagine, Kerry, that we simply uh, had the Federal Reserve raise interest rates. Let's say that they raise interest rates. And they said, you know what we're going to do? We're just going to go back to the average for the last three decades, right? Shouldn't hurt anybody, should it? 
I mean, the last three decades have been great, haven't they? And so we'll just raise the interest rate right back to where it was for the last three decades. The average, uh, Carrie, if we had a federal funds rate of 5.67%, which was the average rate over the last three decades, I would imagine that there would be a total breakdown uh, of, of, of incredible proportions. So this economy is nowhere near healthy. It's dependent upon um, you know, a, a tremendous amount of liquidity, constantly in flowing, uh, accommodative monetary policy to the likes we have never seen. And the fiscal policy, amazingly, somehow is uh, continuing to flow. It's amazing they can get anything done in Washington, but they have. You know, the thing is, is just like we saw underneath the Trump administration, boy, howdy, if big business needs money, watch those politicians work together, Kerry. Boy, if the billionaires need money, I mean, they just come right together. You know, as soon as, Kerry, as soon as somebody who's poor needs money, then uh, suddenly it becomes a real big political debate, uh, Kerry, yeah. right? We don't, we don't have, uh, we got to, we got to really debate this topic, but when it's a billionaire or whenever it's, I don't know, you know, airline companies or uh, other things uh, that didn't prepare for a crisis the way that these poor people should have been prepared, but airline companies weren't prepared, but that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that the big billionaires don't prepare. They can't help it if they need more money. So, you know, they threw money at Warren Buffett. I didn't hear anybody complaining about that in 2020. I didn't hear any, I didn't hardly hear any kind of complaints about fiscal stimulus in 2020. It wasn't until 2021 that we began to hear complaints about fiscal stimulus. I'm trying to figure out what has happened over the last few months that would cause the, the shift. I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's a good question. Well, they did throw some crumbs out to the plebs, right, in the form of PPP, expanded unemployment benefits and all this. And now these so-called stimuli or stimmies, as they call them on mm. the street, have become commonplace. Uh, it's just like uh, part of the annual appropriation bill. It seems <laughs> like uh, when we see failure, our politicians just can't resist uh, embracing it and going for more and more of it. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's, uh, that seems to be the MO and it, that was the MO of the last administration. It's the MO of this administration. I mean, just pump money in and see what sticks, you know, um, uh, we'll see. I, I don't think anybody has returned or, or cut up their stimulus check that they've gotten because of philosophy. Yeah. I think most people are putting them in the bank, but, uh, their Robin hood account. Right. Yeah. Or Robin or putting it into Bitcoin or gold. Yeah. Which is probably, which is probably wise, at least when it comes to gold, Bitcoin, very speculative, but uh, probably both of them a better place to be than the dollar at this point. <laughs> and, you know, I just talked to Peter Schiff uh, and he said, uh, you know, the things you might want to do to protect your family, et cetera, protect your finances. When it really hits the fan, the government is going to turn around and say it was your fault because you bought gold you opted out of the system, you bought Bitcoin, all of these things. Uh, so in a lot of ways, there's no winning, but better to try to do something than to do nothing. But what about, uh, what about the idea that they might outlaw cryptocurrency? Now, I know on a theoretical basis, it's, a, it's impossible. People want to do it. But the fact is, we've got mass surveillance on all of our devices, whether they're desktop, mobile, or tablets, you name it, they're all being monitored. And the fact is, uh, if it's five years in prison with intent to distribute uh, Bitcoin, you know, a lot of people are going to think twice about it. I don't know about if you're willing to go to jail for five years for possession of Bitcoin. Uh, I'd have to think twice about it. <laughs> well, China couldn't do it. China tried to ban cryptocurrency. India is doing is trying to do it as well. We'll see how successful that is. Um, we might all have to flee to China for freedom, uh, ironically, <laughs> yeah, if they crack down on Bitcoin, freedom. right? So freedom and fat soup. Uh, yeah. So yeah. So so China, you know, they tried to ban cryptocurrencies, and if that iron fist couldn't make it work, they finally gave up. Realized we're just gonna. You know, we're not going to do it this way. They've they've actually kind of warmed up to the concept of blockchain. United States 
uh, would probably do something like this. Uh, just like they've been digging coal out of the ground while the rest of the world has been moving on to solar and wind. Uh, so they might try to ban blockchain uh, while other countries are moving on with blockchain technology and advancing. That probably wouldn't be too surprising for the United States to shoot itself in the foot like that. Uh, th I don't really see a problem for the dollar when it comes to, to Bitcoin initially. Uh, you know, Kerry, when you take a look at the actual numbers and the data is pretty fuzzy, I mean, you can see the actual data, but it, again, it's kind of opaque. It's difficult to know exactly how many people own, say, Bitcoin. But from the numbers we have, we use sources like Glassnode. They have some good data in a few other places. What I'm able to gather is that about 1%, realistically, 1% of Americans have purchased Bitcoin. Now, you would think, well, it seems to be more than that. Well, there's certainly many more wallets, but I mean, the average person has many, many wallets. If you count the number of wallets, you would think that there's a tremendous number of people who own Bitcoin. But in reality, it's a fairly small number. Uh, and so, uh, A, you know, I, I guess if they do want to, uh, you know, make it illegal, now would be a good time to do it before people begin ju jumping on the train. But I did also hear from the Federal Reserve recently that they are moving forward with a digital dollar. And they're going to have a test, a test net of some kind, maybe coming out in August, or maybe it's not even this year. I forget the, I don't, I don't have the data in front of me, but I think it was coming up soon. You may know more about it than I do right now, but, or you may have heard something about it, but uh, I know that China has had their own digital yuan. They've been testing a digital yuan uh, and they began that back in 2014, right? Seeing the promise of blockchain technology. So they're way ahead of the curve. The Fed has been dragging its feet. Uh, kind of watching, then, you know, jawboning about Facebook's Libra, and then, you know, having all kinds of mix, mixed messaging around cryptocurrency through the IRS. Now it seems like they're going to be at some point launching their own digital dollar. All this does, uh, Kerry, is create a new demand for digital currency. Uh, what the United States Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve are going to do when they release this cryptocurrency, just like they did in uh, China, the same thing happened, is that they make people aware that they can transact in digital currencies, uh, whereas they didn't know before. So what do you want? Do you want a digital dollar that goes down 6% per year in value? Or do you want another digital currency that goes up 300% in a year, right? Uh, which, where do you want to hold your money? Uh, especially considering that you put it in digital currency and it doesn't go poof. Many people are afraid of digital currencies because they don't know their, I mean, uh, even today, uh, Carrie, you know, one of the things we do here at Follow the Money, one of the things we teach is to diversify your savings. Many people talk about diversifying your investing. You should, uh, but also your savings, your liquid savings away from the dollar. We've been doing this for years. And one of the things we like to do is invest in like things like, you know, the Chinese yuan or the euro to get exposure to other foreign currencies. And many people, Carrie, when we, when we teach this and we talk about it, many people who live in America, because oftentimes we don't get out a lot, we don't really know too much about other nations, sadly, but many people think it's scary to hold the Chinese yuan or it's dangerous or it's, it's dangerous to hold the euro. Uh, well, there's always the risk of foreign currency, there's always foreign exchange risk, but as a whole, I mean, you know, these currencies are relatively stable, just like many other currencies are. And so if you can find stable currencies out there, then you can diversify. Well, for digital currencies, what the Federal Reserve is going to be doing is showing that digital currencies work and they're convenient uh, and they're going to expose people to having a digital wallet. And so we're, we're in the early innings. Uh, and you know, we were on the Bitcoin train very early. I mean, very early. 2013, I was investing in Bitcoin, you know, and we've been just dollar cost averaging. We've seen it rise from, well, over the last, just over the last 12 or 13 months, 14 months or so, we've seen it rise from 5,000 to almost 60,000. But Bitcoin's just one of many. I mean, there's a lot of great projects out there. Cardano, we've been long Cardano for a long time. We've been long Ethereum for a long time. We've been long uh, chain link, you know, for a long time. And there's a lot of these projects that, that, are, that are so innovative when it comes to the technology side and corporations recognize it. It's just the government that's way behind as usual. Um, and so we'll see, we'll see how they handle it. If they try to, if they try to uh, make 
cryptocurrency illegal, then um, I think they'll find A, that it won't work, and B, they'll find that they get way behind in blockchain technology as many other countries accelerate past them. And I don't think the United States can afford that right now. They're already playing, they're already a day late and a dollar short. They've got to, they've got to start playing catch up at some point. Otherwise, China and even even countries in Europe are going to accelerate past the United States if we're not careful. Hey, so what about what's been happening with gold, which is not much? Yeah. Uh, what's so uh, is this just what are you what are your opinions on it? Manipulation or is it just uh, diversion to cryptocurrencies as being more portable, more I don't know, I wouldn't say affordable, but uh, you know what what's the deal? Don't just survive, thrive. The Financial Survival Network. Today's show is brought to you by GR Silver Mining, ticker symbol TSX, GRSL, OTC, GRSLF, and their website at grsilvermining.com. The company is extremely well capitalized, currently has a resource of 40 million ounces of silver, and is looking to triple that number in just the next year alone. Its management team is first rate, headed up by Marcio Fonseca, a geologist with vast experience in mining operations and the financial sector as well. With all this going forward, for it. And with silver trading over $25 the ounce, there's no telling how high GR Silver Mining will go. So go to grsilvermining.com to stay up to date on the latest developments and get on their notification list today. This is the Financial Survival Network, the information you need to thrive now more than ever. Well, as you know, I'm a long-term advocate of gold as, as insurance, physical gold. We've been teaching on gold for a long time and the importance of owning gold. Um, so gold has, and in fact, back to the Federal Reserve on this point, was that we just heard Jerome Powell, the head of the Federal Reserve, state that you know Bitcoin was a form of digital gold, right? A, kind of a, a substitute, if you will, for gold. Well, this has been a concept that's been around for a little bit. And that's why guys like Elon Musk and big corporations like Square and PayPal and many others are jumping aboard. Um, and it's strange to hear the Federal Reserve call a 12 or 13 year old asset a substitute for a, what, 6,000 year old asset. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of twilight zone to see where we are right now. It's a little bizarre. I think that A, yes, Bitcoin has certainly stolen some of gold's thunder. Gold slipped below the 250-day moving average. And we use technical analysis here at Follow the Money. We've been using that for a long time to help people learn how to trade the markets. And the key moving average, there's, there's several key moving averages we watch on gold, but one in particular was the 250-day moving average. Uh, that one was violated just a couple of months ago. And it's been progressively getting you know, a little bit worse and worse. Uh, gold now flirting with about $1,700. Now, when you think about what's been happening, fiscal policy, monetary policy, you would say, why is gold, you know, going down in this environment? You, you and I have lived through, remember the 2009, 2010, this, this feels very similar. The fact that we had a crisis and now the Fed's backed up the truck. And then of course, gold did well in that environment. Silver did well in that environment. I think that, um, that gold is not dead. Uh, it still serves the role of insurance. I just think there's other speculative assets that people can use if they're looking to to, to speculate. And uh, but I, I continue to hold gold. I own more gold than I own Bitcoin as far as my actual outlay. Uh, I own three to one. You know, physical gold. You know, three dollars for and gold for every dollar I have in Bitcoin. But nonetheless, uh, I'm not too concerned about gold's prices. I'm not really too concerned about it at all. It's holding up. I mean, it's it's not collapsing. Um, and I think it's really consolidating. It's still in a long-term uptrend even. So is silver. Silver is on the, on the cusp though. So you watch the 100-day moving average uh, on, the, on silver. That one's been uh, kind of hovering at that area for quite a long time. And I'd like to see it break out. But until silver breaks above 30, we don't really see it as a momentum play. And until gold retakes the 250-day moving average, we would say that the, the overall sentiment will, will remain somewhat you know, soft for a lack of a better word. Okay. So silver, and here's the thing, these things don't just, uh, there isn't an announcement in 
the financial publications, even on FSN or follow the money saying, all right, it's official. Now gold is going to take off. There's no announcement. So if you're not poised to take advantage of it, just like with Bitcoin, you're going to miss it, right? Well, yeah, that's true. You do want to be poised. And, and if you're a long, it all depends on your on your vantage point. If you're a long-term investor, well, you like, you know, you like seeing the depression, uh, the, the, the depression of the price below a certain key level. You see it, you like to see it break down if you're a long-term investor, because that gives you an opportunity to, to add more. If you're a momentum trader or if you're a momentum, you know, investor, then you would want to wait for a breakout of some kind to, to confirm, you know, that, okay, it's taking off. And the reason is, is because we all only have so much money. Uh, and if we're, if we're looking for momentum plays, then we want to be in things that are, have momentum. Uh, right now, when we look globally, like for example, we run many different model portfolios. We run, we run a global model portfolio. Uh, right now, Japan and the Netherlands are, are the hot momentum plays globally, you know, who, who, who would have thunk, but we've been following those and our members have been kind of riding, you know, Japan and, and the Netherlands have been doing pretty well for, for global, you know, ETFs, very broad. Uh, when it comes to uh, precious metals, agriculture, commodities, and energy uh, in that space, you know, we've seen uranium really doing well. We've also seen uh, water, water stocks, you know, doing relatively well over time. Um, lithium has really kind of fallen out of favor. That was one that was doing really well. R rare earths also kind of pulling back. But again, gold miners, gold and silver miners have just been soft in this environment. and uh, it will re really probably depend upon the inflation figures and whether trans whether inflation is believed to be transitory or whether they believe it's going to be you know sustainable and and all of this just really hasn't materialized fully for the the gold and silver investor. But all that being said, there's nothing to complain about with gold and silver. They're both up very nicely. I mean, silver is up fifty percent since we called an up. Uh, our last uptrend on it, May 15th. Gold is up, you know, very nice since we called the uptrend back in January of 2019. Uh, so, I mean, overall, they're all still bullishly postured. It's just a, a lot of consolidation that's happening. And, and quite frankly, some strange data that's coming out of the, uh, of the government that I think investors are trying to make heads or tails out of. Yeah, uh, point noted. Point noted, look what's happened to oil in the past. Uh, six months. At one point, uh, they couldn't give this stuff away. Uh, I had negative prices on the uh, most current future. And now we're looking, uh, it's in the 60s and it's kind of hanging out there. Doesn't mm -hmm. look like it really is going to go much higher. You certainly have experienced the uh, recovery, the rebound in uh, of oil at the pump where uh, the other day uh, for premium unleaded, they wanted $4 a gallon. And I said, mm -hmm. ah, I think I will do the old substitution effect. The car really isn't going to know the difference. And in any event, uh, I don't really care. And I saved like 80 something cents a gallon just right. going for the regular. But, you know, we're seeing this rebound in petroleum prices and that's got to be a worry. One of the things that has made mining so attractive, especially for producers, producing gold miners, silver miners, is a lower energy price because that's mm -hmm. one of their primary inputs. Mm -hmm. So now we've got higher oil prices, although they'll probably come down because the economy isn't that great. You know, it's a real quandary here. But I think when you can find something, anything in this world that is undervalued relative to everything else, probably that's the place you want to be. Yeah, as a as a long term investor, yeah, I would agree. You know, uh, if you're looking to accumulate with a longer term time horizon, you know, then then yes. Um, but certainly, commodities have just done well. I mean, I'm I'm looking right now, for example, at our model uh, commodities portfolio, and as I was mentioning, things like base metals. Uh, have really done well, and they're leading right now on a on a uh, trend strength basis. You mentioned crude oil. We called a new uptrend on crude oil back on December eighteenth of twenty twenty. Issued that to our members. You know that one. You know, uh, crude oil is about up about twenty six percent since that time, and that's been a pretty nice run. Um, and but you know, again, silver miners and silver kind of lagging at this point. Uh, solar energy, even which was a big winner for us last year. 
uh, has also kind of suffered this year. But yeah, I mean, I think, again, there's so many different ways to approach an asset. And for example, when it comes to something like Bitcoin, you know, it's something that I buy and I hold. Uh, we've had that approach since 2013. We just hold. Um, when it comes to gold, we just buy it and we hold it, right? It's it's insurance for our portfolio. So the the little wiggles here and there don't mean anything to me unless I'm a trader. Now, if I'm a trader, then it's a whole different world. If I'm trading, then you know I'm looking at gold right now saying, I don't want to buy this as a trader because I need some sort of impetus. I need some sort of catalyst to ride. You know, just like a surfer needs a wave, a trader needs a trend. And if the trend is just flat, you know, if there is no trend, then you've got to go find a trend if you're a trader. But if you're a long-term investor, then that doesn't matter. You know, you're just looking for things like you said that are cheap, that are maybe on a chart or are down and to the right, you know, down and going down to the right. Well, you know, th that might be a good time to accumulate, you know, but, uh, you know, from a trend basis, you know, things are pretty, pretty flat and uh, cons consolidatory, but the overall uptrend remains intact. It's just, it's just right now, uh, as I've, as I've mentioned, the, the demand isn't as strong as it has been in the past. The perceptions are slightly different. And I, and again, I want to point back to the, some of the muddled data that I think investors are sorting through as they look at the, what's coming out of the government, they're trying to make heads or tails. How is it that you can print this much money and your inflation numbers come in soft? Yeah, that's a good question. I'd love to know the answer to that, Jerry. Pull this off. And on one hand, it's, it's, you know, it's not real good data. Uh, it's fudge data, of course, we know. I mean, the, the real data would be much, much higher if they actually were honest about it. But then B, you also have to factor in the innovation, the incredible innovation, Kerry, and the doubling of knowledge every 18 months. The acceleration of innovation is helping to hold down some of these inflationary forces. But how long that lasts, how long they maintain control. I wrote a book called Bankruptcy of Our Nation. Carrie, the, the country is bankrupt. I mean, there's not even a question. There's not even a question. They can't pay their bills. That they have to, they don't even have a budget half the time. I mean, so the the country is in a bad, bad shape. And the average citizen out there, you know, is on the hook for this. Like you said, they're gonna come for, you know, for all of us eventually, because they got to pay the bills and they don't owe it. We owe it. You know, the, the, the government, you know, they're not writing checks with their name on it. They have to pay back. They're writing checks with our name on it. So we're the ones who have to pay all this back. So, yeah, I mean, gold and silver are ways you protect yourself in this environment. Um, but as far as the trend goes, you know, they're, they're flat right now, technically speaking. Right. Couldn't agree with you more. All right, Jerry, just tell us your site, how we connect with you on the web and uh, what's in it for you at the Follow the Money. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, people can come to followthemoney.com. We got lots of free stuff. We got lots of, you know, we have a great YouTube channel. We have lots of videos. We have lots of free podcasts that go back till 2010. Uh, we, we have uh, loads and loads of articles, but then we have uh, a membership area, which you know, if you want to become a member here at Follow the Money, we have a global investing community. We do live weekly coaching calls. We have a trading software that you can use to identify where to enter a stock, where to exit a stock. We issue new trend alerts every day. So every single one of our members get new trading ideas in their inbox. They also can log into our site and see every stock or ETF that is entering a new uptrend based upon our proprietary system. So people who are looking to ride the momentum in the markets and they're wondering where it is, like you said, followthemoney.com. That's what we do. We, we track the money flows and we alert our members. And so it allows traders to, to stay on the right side of the trend. And then when a trend ends, we alert them so they can, you know, do what they want to do at that point. But we're not financial advisors and we always encourage people to talk to a trusted financial advisor, but we sure provide a lot of research and education and we love teaching. So followthemoney.com, at least check out our free podcast. You'll, uh, you'll learn a lot. All right. Hey, Jerry, it's great to have you back on. Great to touch base and connect, see what you're up to. And uh, we share much of the same opinion on the, the dismal state of affairs, but at least uh, 
at least you can go out and get go to a restaurant, go get go to a bar, get a drink. There's a lot of places in the country where that's been difficult to, up to now for the past year. So we got to be grateful for the small things. Any questions for Jerry? Just send us an email to kl at kerrylutz.com and sign up for a free newsletter, Financial Survival Network. Jerry, always a pleasure. Thanks so much. Thanks, Kerry. Thanks for all you do. Thanks for listening to Kerry Lutz's Financial Survival Network, your solution to today's trying times. For the latest, go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever.